Before we begin, it's only befitting that I apologize to all of you brothers and sisters as well for our uh, lateness. It was due to circumstances beyond our control. We plan and Allah plan and Allah is the best of those who plan. But nonetheless, I ask Allah we to put it all in your mizan of hasanat for your sudden waiting here. I see that we have a lot of young brothers who are here, little guys, and I think that it is important that they are here because the message of today is a far-reaching message. The Asian community suffers from the negative implications of blind following. Blind following. Like for an example, my wife and I are Asians and we're cousins. So we have to marry each other. And before us, my father and my mother, they married each other and they were cousins. And before that, my grandmother, my grandfather, they were cousins and they married. And on and on and on and on. And that is permissible in the deen of Allah as a gentleman for a person to marry his cousin. That's permissible. But the problem is the blind following where I'm forced and compelled to marry my cousin when I'm not the most appropriate person to marry her and she's not the most appropriate person to marry me our parents come and they insist that we have to marry one another although they both have seen and both of them have tasted my parents both of them have tasted the sourness of forced marriages so this issue of blind following is an issue that is inside of the deen and it causes problems and it's an issue outside of the deen that causes problems so i think the presence of these young brothers um, is important and we want them to understand the message that we're talking about the taqlid blind following inside of the deen but it also extends outside of the religion in terms of the secular aspects of people's lives before dealing with the issue, inshallah, a few points that I would like to make. The point at the top of the list is that this issue of blind following is an issue that is scholastic. It's scholastic. <laughs> it is an issue, a mas'ala, that has its delil embedded in the Quran and the Sunnah. Problem with the people is that you have to understand it the way I understand it or I don't like you. And that's a problem different masajid, a masajid not too far away from here because I don't agree with aspects of the religion that they don't agree with they hate me and I hate him and it's a tragedy, it's a terrible state of affairs for the Muslims Muslims in Iraq right now, El Iraq right now with all of the drama that's jumping off in El Iraq they are divided amongst themselves over these sectarian lines your Jamaat, your group, your Manhattan and we stay on it as if, as if we're Mijaneen, Mijaneen, Muslims. Muslims in Philistine, Palestine, right now, they're fighting each other over these sectarian issues. This one is that, from that Jama'at, he's a Khwan Muslim, and I'm Jama'at Tabligh. This one is that, this one is this. He's Shafi and Ahmed. They even go to the Jews and tell the Jews, Muslims, go to the Jews and say, you see those people from that Jama'at or that Medhat, they're terrorists. And then the Jews go and arrest, arrest those people. This is how sick it is with the Muslims. And I don't have to tell you about the situation in Pakistan. I don't have to tell you. The bombs that go off all the time, Muslims can't come and solve their problems. And these issues that confront us are scholastic issues, 
The book of Allah is there. Allah Ta'ala mentioned so many ayahs in the Quran. وَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ الرَّسُولِ If you have any ikhtilaf, if you disagree about anything, if you're a real Muslim, then refer back to the Quran and the Sunnah. Don't refer back to a clash and a cough. Don't refer back to a bomb. Don't refer back to just hating people, lying on people. There are people in this city right now, they actually believe others hate Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I don't believe in the permissibility of celebrating the Prophet's birth. And that's because you're not going to be able to show me that in the Quran or the Sunnah. So I don't believe it. Because I don't believe it, there are those people who believe that I hate the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when they see me, they bite their nails and hope for my demise and the demise of my children. If I were to die, they would clap hands. What kind of religion is that? So this issue is an issue that is scholastic. It's a mas'ala, ilmiya, has knowledge. Hatu burhanakum kuntum sadiqeen. That's what Allah told the Yahud and the Masan in the Quran. Bring your proofs if you're telling the truth. The Jews said they are the people of Allah, they will only be in the hellfire for a few numbers of days, that Allah loves them more than every, everyone else. They said that they are the sons and the beloved of Allah. The Nasara Christian said, he says the son of Allah. Allah used to challenge them in the Quran. Qul hatu burhanakum kuntum sadiqeen. Bring your proofs if what you're saying is true. Don't hurl abuses on us, the Muslims. Don't make accusations like little children in the playground when a thing doesn't go your way and you don't have any other proof. All you do is say, give me my ball. Give me my ball. I'm leaving. Give me my ball. And it's his ball, so he walks off of the court. He walks off of the pitch like a little child. Bring your delil. This issue, this issue is an issue of knowledge. It's scholastic. And since it is a scholastic issue, I'm going to be fair and just and tell you right from the beginning, there are legitimate, bona fide scholars who said that you have to make taqlid. Bona fide scholars. So if you have someone or you know someone who's saying, you must make taqlid, don't say that he's a deviant. Don't say that he came with something new in the religion. There are people who are bigger than him who made that claim. And on the other end of the spectrum, are scholars who said you don't have to make taqlid and it's not permissible to make taqlid. There's a middle course and this is what I want to share with you. My position is stay away from the extremes. We pray every single day, 17 rakat at least. We ask Allah Ta'ala, the Rabbil Alameen, ihdina sarat al-mustaqeen. The sarat al-mustaqeen is the middle course. Make me a person who when I hate, I don't go overboard in my hate. When I love, I don't go overboard in my, in my love. That's the Salat al-Mustaqib. Make me a person who I worship, but I don't worship all day, all the time. When I work, I work, but I don't work all day, all the time. Just be in balance. Just be in balance. So this issue, it has its two extremes. One extreme is the extreme of the person who says, Wallahi, you have to make taqlid. You must make taqlid. And if you don't make taqlid, you're not practicing Islam correctly. That's an extreme. Because he doesn't have any clear dalil. He doesn't have the example of the companions doing that and saying that. Extreme. The other extreme is the guy who comes and says, taqlid, no one makes taqlid. The farmer in Kashmir, in Mirpur, Azad Kashmir right now, he's walking behind his oxen and he's plowing the land. He can't make taqlid. He has to be a mujtahid. That's extreme. That's extreme. Because everybody in this room, without any exception, and Allah, from the inset, from the ends, from Bani Adam, everyone in this building is going to make taqlid in something. What is not permissible to make taqlid in is what you have the ability to comprehend. What is permissible to make taqlid in is what is bigger than you. It's an issue that's above you. It's an issue above Abu Usama and above Abu Bilal and above Faisal and, and so and so on. This issue is too big. So I'm going to follow what Allah Ta'ala commanded me to follow in the Quran. Ask those who know if you don't know. Well, this issue is too big for me. 
So I'm going to just blindly follow because I don't have the alat and the apparatuses, scholastic apparatuses, knowledge to get to the bottom of this. So I choose this scholar who I respect, the honor, I believe in him, and I follow him. Everyone's going to do that to a certain degree. But when the delil comes to you and you're educated, you, you are educated, and it's clear that the prophet said, this is the sunnah and this is the religion, and you turn around and say, no, Abu Hanifa said, no, Abu Usama said, no, the imam of my masjid said, now this is the problem. This is the taqlid that is not permissible. Second issue, Khwani, that I want to bring to your attention, inshaAllah ta'ala, is the fact that <coughs> all of the scholars, you know, some scholars say you have to make taqlid. Some said you can't make taqlid. It's haram. In every case scenario, it's haram. They have ikhtilaf about that. Second point is that the scholars are unanimously agreed that it is not permissible for Muslims to hate and to love based upon this issue. I say you must make taqlid, and the other says you can't make taqlid, and we hate and we fight each other over that. I don't pray behind him, he don't pray behind me. I say that he's an innovator, he says that I'm an innovator. I say that he hates Islam, he says that I hate Islam. So the scholars have ikhtilaf. Some of them, there's ikhtilaf. Some says, yes, you have to do taqlid. Others say, no, you can't do taqlid. And then the third group is in the middle. You have to do taqlid when you don't have the ability to figure the situation out. So it's an issue of ikhtilaf. All of the ulama agree, all of them agree that it's not permissible for me to love you based upon your position in this issue. For me to hate you based upon this position in your religion. There are certain people who claim a connection to Islam just one example are the people who curse the companions of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam radiyallahu anhu ajma'in. There are some people in Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh. They say that Abu Bakr and Umar were homosexuals. They say that the Quran is incomplete. They say that Aisha radiyallahu anha used to commit zina multiple times you have a religious obligation to take a position against that person to draw lines in the sand and say hey if you don't change that course of thinking then you're an enemy to me just as if he said that about your biological mother someone came and said your mother is this your mother your mother gave you birth you're going to draw a line in the sand some of us won't even waste time drawing a line we're just going to jump on them you said that what about my mother you're going to jump on them. Someone says about the companions that they were kuffar and they apostated after the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam except six or five of them. We have to draw a line in the sand and say, this issue right here, I'm not playing with you. I'm not smiling with you. I'm not making you feel like everything is cookie crunch between you and me. You are an enemy to me. You better know that. I'm going to let you know that from Jump Street, right out the door. But on this issue, taqlid, some say yes, some say no, some take the middle course. The scholars of Islam are unanimously agreed that this is not an issue that allows Muslims to love based upon it, to hate based upon it. This is something that's not permissible. Those are the first two points that I wanted to mention. The third point before getting to the issue is, I don't believe that taqlid is wajib, Abu Usama. I don't believe it's wajib just like that open-ended. Nor do I believe that it is haram, open-ended. I believe that taqlid becomes an obligation when you don't know, when the issue is bigger than you. Some issue comes to you and you don't have the ability to weigh the proofs, the pros and the cons, the statements and positions of the ulama. It's too much for you, it's overwhelming for you, man or woman. So, you look in the scales of who's out there. Al Imam al Bukhari, Al Imam Abu Hanifa, Al Imam ibn Mutaymiyyah, Al Imam or Sheikh ibn Baz, for an example. And you say, okay, I'm going to follow what the Sheikh said in this particular issue. But, because I'm making taqlid, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. I'm going to keep my mouth shut and I'm not going to argue. Because a taqlid, pay attention. 
The meaning of a taqlid, the meaning, the definition of it is taking someone else's position and you don't know his delil. You don't know why. You took the position because you didn't know. So because you don't know and you're just blindly following someone, ask the person with knowledge if you don't know. Okay, I'm asking him. It's too big for me. Is it permissible, Abu Usama, for someone to come after his death and to take his lungs out and put it in another body? That's a big issue. On one hand, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, Kasru, Admin Mayt, Kakasri Wahid. Breaking the dead person's bone when he's a, when he's dead is like breaking it when he's alive. So if a person is dead, he has sanctity. You can't just step on his grave. The Nabi used to walk through the graveyard without his shoes. He told his people, take off your shoes. Not all the time. But one of the reasons he told them to take the shoes off, out of respect for the dead people. He said, La Qabur. Don't sit on the dead people's grave. They have sanctity. Sanctity. And I'm thinking most of you know the hadith of the man who told his sons. He was about to die. He said, if I die. I want you to take my body. I want you to burn my body. Once it becomes ashes, take the ashes, spread them in the sea, spread them in the air, spread them on land. Because if Allah has the ability to bring me back together, He's going to punish me and punish me. He never punished anyone else before. And then when He died, His sons did that. Elijah brought them back together and said, Why did you do that? He said, I was afraid of you. I was afraid of you. And Allah Ta'ala forgave him. His crime that He used to commit, he used to go at night time and used to dig up the dead people and then take the thing that they were buried out and watch it and sell it. He himself knew that was sacrilegious. So the point is, Abu Usam, what's the ruling of a person donating his lungs and so forth so after, after his death? Well, those hadiths suggest that his body does not belong to him. He can't donate his body. He can't do that. But then there are other Ayat of the Quran Hadith. Woman Ahyaha Fakanaba Ahyad Nasa Jamia. Anyone who gives life to someone will be like he gave life to the whole mankind. So I have two proofs. I don't know. I'm just gonna blindly follow what this shit said because I don't know. So the point here is the third point, the third point is I'm of the opinion that you can't blindly follow open ended. And blindly following is something that is done by the person who doesn't know. He's overwhelmed by the proofs. But if blind following was permissible, open-ended, open then I'm not sitting before you trying to fight something against the religion. Allah Ta'ala told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to tell those kuffar of Quraysh, قُلْ إِنْ كَانَ لِلْرَحْمَانِ وَلَدٍ فَأَنَا أَوَّلٍ And meaning, tell them, Ya Muhammad, Allah Ta'ala told the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Tell him Ya Muhammad If Allah Ar-Rahman had a son Then I Muhammad I'm going to be the first one who worships that son The Nabi didn't tell the Christians This is shirk and dalala Just to be against khayr If you can prove that Allah has a son I'm going to be the first of those people Who worship that son if a taqlid, open-ended, was from the religion, I'm going to be the first one to do it. Before you guys, I'm going to precede you to it. So don't look at me as a person who's sitting here trying to shove something down your throat and trying to be against some aspect of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are quite a number of proofs from the Quran and the Sunnah. A number, a lot, that show that a Muslim is responsible when the truth comes to him and he has the ability to recognize that truth for what it is he has to take that truth irregardless of who is doing it or who's not doing it the truth comes to him and it's very clear but his imam or his sheikh or someone that he's respecting is saying something opposite of that truth and he second guesses himself and says well the sheikh didn't say it, the sheikh didn't do it, so therefore I'm going to stick with my position. There are a number of ayat of the Quran that goes to show the problem of a taqlid, this type of blind fowl, uh, that show this is a practice of the mushrikeen, this is a practice of the munafiqeen. 
This is a practice of Ahlul Kitab. It's not a practice of people of Al-Islam unless the people of Al-Islam, they don't know the answer. So he just blindly follows the one who is in front of him. Allah Ta'ala mentioned what happened to Ahlul Kitab. For an example, And Surah al Tawbah, Allah Ta'ala described what happened to the Jews and the Christians. He said they took their priests and their monks as lords along with Allah. There was a man who lived during the time of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His name was Hatim ibn Ta'i. Hatim al Ta'i. His father was a, an important personality in Jahiliyyah. His sister and him became Christians. And then they came to the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he started giving them dawah. And then the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam read this ayah to him and said to him, You people, you worship your priests and you worship your monks. Your shiyukh and your ulama, you made them gods along with Allah, laws along with Allah. And then he read that ayah. They took their laws, their monks and their priests as arbab min dunillah. Gods, laws other than Allah. The man said, La, we didn't do that. We didn't do that. And he had accepted Islam from the da'wah of the Nabi. He said, we didn't do that. We didn't make sajda to them. We didn't make ruku, prostration, and we didn't bow down to them. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him, No, I'm not talking about that. Didn't they make halal what Allah made haram? And they made haram what Allah made halal? They say, Yes, yes, we that they, they did that. And didn't you follow them in that? You knew it was haram. Proof came to you it was haram. Proof came to you it was halal. The opposite of what your monks and priests were saying, you followed them? He said, yes, 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 that happened. He said, Tilka ibadatakum That was your worship of those people. When the proofs came to you and you continued to follow them and those things that were impermissible, that was your ibadah to those individuals. Why would Allah reveal that ayah to us? So that we can read that like a story, Rumpelstiltskin, Goldilocks and the Seven Dwarfs. That story is there so that the Muslim will know, don't be like that. Don't take your monks, your shiyukh, your ulama, and your teachers as lords along with Allah. Meaning, when they make a mistake, and it's clear that they made a mistake, it is crystal clear. Don't make excuses. Just say, with all due respect to the imam, to the sheikh, to the alim, even if he's one of the sheikhs of the madhabs, with all due respect, I believe he got it wrong in that issue and I'm going to do the second thing or the other thing, the alternative thing. Another proof is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned what he commanded with in the Quran when he said, and he commanded us with this. Follow what was revealed to you by your Lord, what came to you from your Lord. Follow what was revealed to you by your Lord, the Quran and the Sunnah. Now there's some young people in here who may be thinking wrongly that only the Quran came from Allah Azza The Quran and the Sunnah came from Allah Azza wa The Prophet said in authentic hadith sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ala inni utitu al-Quran wa mithluhu ma'ahu. I've been given the Quran and what is similar to it. The companions and the ulama after the companions. They used to believe and they used to say, Jibril came to the Prophet ﷺ with the Sunnah the same way he came to the Nabi with the Quran. There are differences between the two. Now is not that discussion. But the point is, Allah Ta'ala mentioned all of those ayahs of the Quran. وَمَا أَتَاكُمْ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوا وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُوا Whatever the Rasul gives you, take it. Whatever he told you not to do, leave it. If you gave a man this Quran and you said, okay, you go and live on that mountain over there or that island over there with the Quran and he knows all of the Qira'at, the ten Qira'at, he knows them. If you ask that man, hey, read the next ayah, then follow an ayah that comes after the last place in the Quran where Allah says, Inna Allah ghafoor rahim What's the next ayat? The last place, because that's mentioned many times in the Quran. The last ayat where Allah says in Allah, I want you to read that. That man has the ability 
to read, to pick up that ayah. That's how prolific and knowledgeable he is with the issue. If you put him on an island by himself, and you put another man on an island with the sunnah, the authentic sunnah, all of the sunnah, the man who's on the island with the sunnah is going to practice Islam better than the one who's on the island with the Quran. Because that guy over there, he's not going to know how to pray the five prayers. He's not going to know how to pray. He's not going to know how to do Ramadan. He's not going to do Taraweeh. He's not going to know how to do Hajj. He's even going to marry women who are haram for him. Because some of the women who you can't marry are in the Sunnah and not in the Quran. He's going to be what? He's going to be naqis, deficient. I just give you that example so that you can comprehend what I'm saying. As for the Quran and the Sunnah, they have to be together. So those people who say, for you young brothers, I only take the Quran, that's it. You're from the most lying, they're from the most lying of the people. The Quran yun. You can't practice Islam without the Quran and the Sunnah. Anyway, Allah Azza wa mentioned in this particular ayat, <coughs> follow what has been revealed to you from your Lord, the Quran and the Sunnah, and don't follow the awliya. Don't follow. Allah said in the Quran, وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا awliya." Don't follow the awliya. Al Imam Al Shafi, Al Imam Abu Hanifa, Al Imam Malik, Al Imam Ahmed. I believe those people from the awliya of Allah. I believe that. And Allah knows best. Allahu Allahu Akbar. But I believe that the ulama who had a lot of knowledge. But the Quran said, follow what Allah revealed and don't follow human beings. Follow the human being when the human being is following what Allah revealed. If the human being is not following what Allah revealed, then don't follow him. So that is an ayat of the Quran that shows the impermissibility of following people indiscriminately, unconditionally, no matter what he says, I'm going to follow. Another example of the ayat of the Quran that show the evil of blindly following is what Allah revealed in Surah Al-Baqarah. He said, If تَبَرَّأَ الَّذِينَ تُبِئُوا مِنَ الَّذِينَ تَبَئُوا وَرَأُوا الْعَذَابِ وَتَقَطَّعَتْ بِهُمْ أَسْبَابَ وقال, وقال الذين تبرأ وقال الذين تبقوا لو أن لنا كرة فنتبرأ منهم كما تبرأوا منا حسرات عليهم وكذلك يبيهم الله أعمارهم حسرات عليهم ما هم بخارجين من النار يوم القيامة those people who were followed, those people who were followed, Allah said, those people who were followed are going to free themselves from those people who followed them. The ones who were followed, they're going to free themselves from those people who followed them. And the ones who did the following are going to say, oh, how we wish on this day we can go back to the world to free ourselves from them the way they just free themselves from us. And Allah shows them their deeds, hasaratin alayhim. Their deeds are going to come as a, as a cause of sorrow for them. And they won't come out of the hellfire. Blindly following is a mushkila. It's a big problem. Blindly following when you have the ability not to blindly follow. The, the mas'ala raf'u liyadain. Raf'u liyadain. I'm a new Muslim. Abu Usama. New Muslim. I come to Islam. I see that this is an issue that has ikhtilaf in it. Some people say do it, some people say don't do it. And when I became a Muslim, I was exposed to Asian people, Pakistanis, they are in America. They brought me this stuff. I had to pray the way they prayed. I don't know what's going on. I'm a brand spanking new Muslim. So I'm going to do what they taught me to do. I don't have any choice. The new Muslim, when he's praying, he's just going to do what people are doing next to him. Sometimes it even feels a bit strange. You even feel dumb, stupid. You're just following people. It's a feel. It's a feeling that is, it's not even right. When I used to pray, I used to say, "Man, I feel stupid just following these dudes. What they doing like that?" As time went on, as time went on, they gave me a book. I started reading what I have to say. Before I stand up, I have to say, "No way to an usali hadi salat khalfa hadi imam." I used to have to do my knee and all of this. As time went on, I started reading other sources, and I started seeing. There's no hadith that told me to do that. But instead, there are hadith that are authentic that told me to do this and do that. And these people who they're telling me to respect like Al Imam al-Bukhari. Al Imam al-Bukhari wrote a book about Raf'ul Yadain. 
So why aren't they doing roughly a day? Why are they not doing it? As time came up, started going on, I started to wait. And that was an issue that was clear that the Nabi used to do it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Clear, like the sun in the sky. But the person says, I'm not going to do it. Why? Because that's not my mother. Because that's not the way they taught me to pray when I first became a Muslim. No, it's the responsibility of the Muslim to follow the proofs when they come to him if he has the ability. If he doesn't have the ability, he can't say, he can't say, I'm a mujtahid. doesn't have the ability. And if he has the ability, he can't take the other extreme. And the other extreme is the imam must have known. Who told you that the imam must have known? Who told you that? Before I read to you, brothers, some more a hadith and ayah, listen to this. Everybody here, I'm talking about the shortest shorty in here from the brothers and the girls. The shortest kid knows. The best of this ummah is Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhu. The Prophet used to always say, I believe and Abu Bakr and Umar believe. I came and Abu Bakr and Umar came. I went and Abu Bakr and Umar went. When Tamim al-Dari saw the Dajjal, <clears throat> Tamim al-Dari used to be a Christian, he became a Muslim, the Nabi told the people about the Dajjal. Those people who were with Tamim al-Dari radiallahu anhu, they had became shipwrecked. And when they were trying to fix their boat, they went on the land. And they went and they saw the Dajjal tied up. And he spoke to the Dajjal. And the Dajjal spoke to them and asked them a number of questions. Told them, I'm coming out soon. It was a sign that would made them afraid. When they left that place and they went back to Medina, Tanim and Dadi told the Nabi about the story. Something that the Nabi told the people about previously, about a Dajjal. Now one of his companions actually saw the situation. The Nabi told someone, make the Adhan. He made the Adhan, which was the sign, come to the masjid. When they came to the masjid, the Nabi sallallahu told Tamim, tell them the story. Tamim and Dadi told them the story about what happened. He saw the Dajjal and he was tied up in chains. And he said, I'm coming out soon. <coughs> and that man Muhammad is saying the truth. You better follow him. After he finished the story, this is the point. The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, I believe in what he said. And Abu Bakr and Umar believes in what he said. The Nabi used to always say that. Abu Bakr and Umar. Abu Bakr and Umar. He would tell the people, nobody come and see me. I don't want to see anybody. When he was thinking about divorcing his wife. Oh, nobody knock on my door. First person who came and knocked on his door, Abu Bakr, come in. Second person, Umar, come in. They had a green light to come to him at all times. Now this is the point. Listen to this. The Imam must have known. The Imam must have known. I know it's saying this and it seems clear, but it seems clear to me, but the Imam must have... Who told you that? Point I want to share with you. The companion from the companions of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam radiallahu anhu majma'in Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. He's from the ulama of the Muslims. He went to the house of Umar, and Umar was the Amir al-Mu'mineen at that time. Knocked on the door, no one came. Knocked on the door second time, no one came. Knocked on the door the third time, no one came and left. When Umar finally came to the door, he saw that it was Abu Musa going away. He let him go. Later on in the day, he saw him. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, you came to my house, you knocked three times, and then you left. Why did you leave? He said, because I heard the Prophet say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if one of you knocks three times and the door is not open, then go away. Um, I never heard that hadith. He said, hey, if you don't bring someone to collaborate and to prove that they heard that from the Nabi, I'm going to deal with you. I'm going to hit you over your head with a stick. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu went to the masjid in al Medina. When he came into the masjid, he saw the Ansar sitting like all of you brothers are sitting amongst themselves. They looked at him when he came in, they said, what's the matter? You look like something happened. He told them the story. They started laughing. They started smiling. Not ridiculing him. They thought it was amusing what happened. They started smiling. They said, wallahi, we all heard the, the, this hadith of the Nabi. All of us heard that hadith. And even the youngest from amongst us, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. He was a young man. 
And he grew up to be from the ulama, the companions. They said, we're going to sin with you to the Amir al-Mu'mineen, this young boy, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, this young kid. Not to mention the other people from the Ansar of al-Medina. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri went with Abu Musa al-Ash'ari to the Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar radiallahu anhu, and said, yes, Amir al-Mu'mineen, I heard the Nabi say this, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now the question is, the Sheikh must have known, the Sheikh must the question is, the simple question, and you guys are intelligent, how many times did Umar come to knock on the door of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? How many times was Umar in the house of the Nabi and someone came and knocked on the door? How many times did Umar radiallahu anhu sit with the other companions? He was the Khalifa. That means three years. Abu Bakr, two years, two and a half, three years. Abu Bakr was the Khalifa. And Umar never knew this hadith, never knew this sunnah. And then when it came that day, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, he put it to the test. Umar didn't know. Something as easy and as simple as that. And that's why Al-Imam Malik, when the Khalifa during his time, his name was Mansur, Al-Imam Malik, the Khalifa during his time, one of them was Mansur. Mansur said to Al-Imam Malik, I'm going to make your hadith book and muwatta I'm going to make it the dastur. I'm going to make it the main book for the Muslim empire. And Imam Malik said, don't do that, Ya Amir al because there's not a single person except some of the Sunnah has passed them by. You young brothers, you have to get rid of this idea. And Imam Abu Hanifa knew everything. It's not true. That's not true at all. No human being knows everything about the deen except one person, and that is who? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Everybody else. And Imam Mahdi was teaching his students. He pointed to the grave of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And those of you who have been to Medina, you know where his grave is. He used to teach close to the Rawda. And Imam Mahdi, he said, everybody's statements, every human being's statements are accepted or rejected except the person who's in that grave. And he pointed to the grave of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Bakr. His statements are accepted or rejected based upon the proofs. Umar, Uthman, Ali, and everybody other than them. From the Adillah, from the Kitab, and from the Sunnah of the Nabi, and I really need you people to really focus with me on this. A taqlid, just like that, is from the Asul of Al Jahiliyyah. It's from the foundations of Jahiliyyah. What Jahiliyyah? was built upon Jahiliya before the Nabi came Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Blind following is from the foundations like in Islam the five pillars of Al-Islam the six pillars of Al-Iman Jahiliya before Al-Islam Jahiliya one of the pillars of Jahiliya blind following that's what Shaykh Al-Islam Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahab said in his book Kashf al-Shubahat Hamid ibn Abdul Wahhab. Some people hear that name, they say, Wahhabi, you Wahhabi. If you were to ask them, tell me something you know about Al Imam Muhammad Abdul Wahhab. He doesn't know anything. He's just blindly following. What's blind following? Taking someone else's opinion and you don't know why. Taqlid is when you take a horse or a cow, you put in his nose a ring and you just pull him and he goes like that. He doesn't know where you, even if you pull him off of the cliff. He's going to follow you. He's not going to ask you, yo, 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 where you going? Yo, yo, hold on, hold on. I got a different idea. I got a different point of view. He just goes with them. You don't want to be like that. That's what they call a qala'i, the taqlid. When you do the animal, qalidhu, tie him up, and he's just going to go with you. The Muslim can't be like that. Abdullah ibn Abdullah ibn Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. You guys have to read about Abdullah ibn Mas'ud as much as you can because the Nabi said if Abdullah ibn Mas'ud comes to you with something, take what he says. He was a companion that after the death of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he went to Kufa. And the Prophet told this community, his companions and us, he told us a lot of fitness going to be in Kufa. Was sadaqa Rasulullah. Look at all the fitness in Iraq. Wallahi Muhammad Rasulullah. 
Abdullah bin Mas'ud was in that area. He saw the Khawarij. He saw the Qadriya. He saw the Shiite. He saw the fight in between the Muslims. So whenever you find these statements of Ibn Mas'ud, especially in the true Minhaj, you'll find him making more statements than any other companion because he was in the midst of the fitna. He told us, لا تكونوا إما إذا أحسن الناس أحسنت وإن أساء الناس أساءت ولكن تفطينوا إذا أحسن الناس أحسن معهم وإذا أساءوا فلا تحسن معهم He said, Ibn Mas'ud, don't be a copycat. Don't be a copycat. If the people do good, you do good. If the people do bad, you do bad. But be a person who weighs the situation. If the people do good, do good with them. If they do bad, don't do bad with them. That's the Muslim. Because those people who were followed are going to free themselves from those who followed them. And those who did the following are going to say, we want to go back and get another chance and we'll free ourselves from them the way they free themselves from us. Be too late at that time. Don't make tuck lead like that when you don't have the ability. When you don't have, when you have the ability to distinguish. Anyway, a taqli de khwani is from the pillars of al-jahiliya. When the prophets and messengers came to their people and they said to their people, Qulu la ilaha illallah. The people said no. When they were asked, why do you say no? They say, this is not what our fathers used to do. The uncle of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Talib, he used to protect the Nabi, he was a mushrik, he was a kafir. But he used to tell Quraysh, anybody touch my nephew, I'm going to deal with you. He was about to die. The Nabi came to him and said, Oh uncle, just say la ilaha illallah. If you say it, I'm going to argue with it for you. Yom al Qiyamah. He didn't make any salah. He didn't make any hajj. He didn't make any zakat. Nothing. Just say la ilaha illallah. You're going to go to Jannah. He looked around at Abu Lahab and Abu Jahan and the rest of them. He said, la, I'm going to follow. I'm going to die on the religion of my fathers. A taqlid is from the pillars that Jahiliya was built upon and predicated upon. Even worse than that. Although there's nothing worse than shirk. But for some reason, our ummah, we look at other actions as being greater than shirk. They followed, and they, they followed their fathers and rejected the prophets and the messengers and they remained in shirk. The biggest crime for no other reason other than that's what my father used to do. But I'll give you another example. Everybody knows the ayat in Surah Al-Nahi. Allah Ta'ala mentioned, وَإِذَا بُشِّرَ أَحَدُهُمْ بِالْأُنْفَى ظَلَّ وَجْهُهُ مُسْوَدًّا وَهُوَ كَذِيمٌ يَتَوَارَى مِنَ الْقَوْمِ مِنْ سُوءِ مَا بُشِّرَ بِهِ أَنْ يُمْسَكُهُ عَلَى هُمٍ أَمْ يُدُّسُهُ فِي التُّرَى أَلَا سَاءَ مَا يَحْكُمُونَ Listen to this. When one of them is given the news that his wife gave birth to a daughter, his face becomes black and darkened with shame and sorrow. He's ashamed that he had a baby girl. He starts to hide from the people and he starts to avoid his friends out of embarrassment that he had a baby girl. And he starts to ponder and he thinks, should I keep her alive and be down and disrespected or should I bury her in the dirt? Allah said, Allah sa'ama yahkumun. What a terrible decision they decide to make. They used to bury her in the dirt. Now listen to this. Those of you who have daughters, just imagine when your daughter was born, your little baby, your baby girl was born. She has eyes like a dove. She has nice hair. When you give her the tahnik for the tama, the tama, the dates, after seven days, or after she's born and you give her the dates, See me doing like this. And you be like, mashallah, man, that girl's pretty. She's the apple of your eye. Just imagine your brothers, your father, your wife's father, all of the men in the society, your friends come to you and say, yo, yo, you got to bury that bin. You got to put it in the dirt and bury her alive. Or throw her out in the desert and let the wolves and hyenas eat her and tear her apart. You're going to say, man, is you crazy for saying something like that? You're out of your mind. Quraysh, that's what they used to do. If you go and you ask Abu Lahab, Abu Jahl, why did you bury your daughter alive? 
The answer is going to be, that's what I found my father's doing. That's what my father's used to do, and that's why I'm doing Just imagine that mentality. Imagine that mentality. And the Asian community is not far from that. Where we socially bury our daughters. In Africa, East Africa. Muslims who come from Sudan. Muslims who come from Egypt. Muslims who come from Eritrea. Muslims who come from Ethiopia. In East Africa and other parts. Muslims in Yemen. They give the girl a circumcision. Circumcision. Where they cut her parts out and take them out and sew it up. You can't put up. She can barely urinate. If you ask them, why do you do that? Why do you do that? They say, this is what my fathers used to do. Taklid. Taklid. Why are you forcing your son to marry your, nephew, your niece? Why are you for This is what we used to do. Yeah, but he speaks English and he doesn't speak Urdu or Mirpuri very well. And she only speaks Mirpuri and she doesn't speak English at all. Why, why are you doing it? It's something that we have to do. It's taklid. It's taklid. From what shows us the impermissibility and the danger of a taklid is what the Nabi says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, beside Bukhari, what was collected on the authority of Abu Huraira. The Nabi says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Lo amana biya ashratu min al-Yahud, la amana biya al Yahud. He said, if 10 people from the Jews believed in me, then all of the Jews would have believed in me, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sayyid Bukhari. If 10 people from the Jews believed in me, then all of the Jews would have believed in me. It is a historical fact. Those who want to read about the companions, there are many books that were written. Who are the companions? Many books. Clearly the Nabi had more than, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 10 Jews who believed in him. Way more than 10. His wife, Sophia bintu Huyi was a Jew. He had more than 10. Many of them believed. But what does this hadith mean? The scholar who gave the explanation, interpretation of the hadith of Sayyid Bukhari, his name is Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, he said the meaning of the hadith, when you gather up the different narrations of this hadith in Bukhari and other than Bukhari, is talking about if ten of the ulama of the Yahud believed in me, then all of the Yahud would have believed in me because the Yahud blindly follow their ulama. They blindly follow their scholars. It is a way of the Jews. It is a way of the Jews. Why do we not find many Jewish people becoming Muslims? We found some, but why don't we find a lot of them? We find a lot of Christians becoming Muslims, not a lot of Jews. The Jews, in their religion, they have to leave it up to the rabbi to explain to them the Torah. And they have another book called the Talmud. The Torah that they believe was revealed to Musa, which it wasn't, it was tampered with and contaminated. The Ulema of the Yahu came and wrote another book which is called the Talmud, which is the explanation of the Torah. They hardly ever read the Torah. Hardly, today, hardly ever read it. The book that the Jew is connected to is the Talmud. And the Talmud is what? The tafsir of the Torah according to the ulama. And they teach their people this. You have to be connected to the scholar. You have to be connected to this guy. So from the air, way from their sunnah is to blindly follow those who have been put in positions of authority over them. Just to move ahead of one because there are quite a few other ayat and ahadith, I want to just give you some examples concerning the companions of the Allah. Pay attention guys. The only Islam that Allah is going to accept Yom al and I'm telling you this without biting my tongue for anyone. Allah is not going to accept the Islam of Jamaat Tabligh, Khwan Muslimi, Sufi, Shiite. Allah is not going to accept the Islam of Brailwis, Dilbandis. The only Islam that Allah will accept Yom al Qiyamah by the Lord of the Kaaba is the Islam of the people who are doing what the companions did. 
If the companions came together and they made the dhikr of Allah, Uwa, 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 Allah, 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 and you do that, then Allah will accept it from you. But if they didn't do that and you're doing that, Allah is not going to accept that from you. I don't care. You jump up and down, you get upset. The only Islam that Allah is going to accept from you is if your Islam is similar to what Abu Bakr and Umar Uthman and Ali was doing. Now I can take ayahs from this Quran and I can bend them to mean whatever I want them to mean. I can show how black people are in the Jannah and everybody else is in the hellfire. I can show you that with this Quran. But the question is, did Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and Ali understand that ayat the same way? Now, during the time of the companions, it did not exist where the companions took the position of one person from amongst them no matter what he said. It didn't happen. They only followed what Abu Bakr said. They only followed what Umar said. No, they didn't happen. That alone goes to show that this is an innovation and something that should be abandoned. And I can give you many examples but I'll only give you two or three here today, inshallah. After the death of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, he died. For those who don't believe that he died, there are people going to come your Mokam and they live right now and they say the Nabi didn't die. He didn't die. After the death of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they shrouded him, they washed him, the salat was prayed over him, he was buried. And now he's in his grave. That time to now, in the barzakh, Living a life that Allah knows this reality like the Mujahideen who were killed fi sabillah. As for death, he died. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Bakr, when he became the Khalifa, there were a group of people who said, we're not going to give you the jizya anymore. Abu Bakr said, we're going to fight you. I'm in charge of the Muslims. Our whole community is going to fight you. He went to Abu Bakr, he went to Umar, and the rest of the community said, those people in the desert, they said they believe in Allah, they believe in Salat, they believe in everything, but they're not going to give the zakat. We have to go and fight them. Umar said, how are we going to fight them? And they say, La ilaha illallah. Muhammad al-Rasulullah. And they make Salat. Oh, I'm not fighting them. They're Muslims. Their blood is sacred. You can't kill them. And all of the other companions said the same thing to Abu Bakr. Although he was the most knowledgeable one from amongst them. And they knew that. He was the most knowledgeable. They said, we're not doing that. And then Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu started to debate with them. And he said, didn't you people hear that the Nabi said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, umirtu an uqatin an nasa hatta yashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad an abdu wa rasul wa yaqimu salat wa yutu zakat. I've been commanded to fight the people until they say la ilaha illallah until they make the salat and give the zakat. He said, wallahi. If they used to give the zakat to the Nabi, just some small portion they used to give to him, if they say they're going to give that to me, I'm going to fight them. And then the heart of Umar and the rest of the companions was open, and they said, yes, yes. The haq is with Abu Bakr. Why didn't they just say, Abu Bakr is the best of the ummah? The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, follow Abu Bakr. Take my sunnah and the sunnah of the Khulafa al-Rashidin. Abu Bakr is at the top of the list. Everybody said, we're not dealing with that program until Abu Bakr proved it. Another example, what the companions were on. They didn't know this taqlid. They blindly followed the Mustafa al-Mukhtar, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That was it. Look what happened, Ikhwan. In one of the first, in one of the wars that happened with the companions after the death of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa during the lifetime of Abu Bakr, many of the Qura who memorized the Quran were murdered, they were killed. Umar radiallahu anhu came to Abu Bakr, pay attention to this. He said, hey, Amir al-Mu'mineen, if it keeps going the way it's going, every time we have a war, more and more memorizers of the Qur'an will be killed until ultimately the Qur'an won't be here anymore because it's in the hearts of the people of God. He said, we better do something about bringing this Qur'an together. Abu Bakr said, yes, it's a good idea. Let's go to Zaid ibn al-Thabit. He was young. 17 years old, 17 on that day. Abu Bakr and Umar went to him and said, Hey, we want you to put this Quran together because the Prophet made dua for you and you went and you learned the language of the Jews in 12 days. You memorize the Quran, you're intelligent. We want you to bring this Quran together. What did that 17 year old boy do? 
He said, well, Lahi, I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. Because the Nabi never said that this was permissible. He said, I'm not putting the Quran together because the Nabi never told us to put the Quran there. Are you telling me to do something that the Nabi didn't tell us to do? Abu Bakr, Umar said, hold it, hold it, hold it. Didn't Allah say in the Quran, Arif Lam Mim, Thalik al Kitab, La Riba Fi? It's a book. He said, yeah, he did say that. And he started reading those ayat that Allah described the Quran as a book. It wasn't a book as such. It was in their minds, in their hearts. Some people had it written down. He had it written down on some leather. He had it written down on a bone. He had it written down on a, on a leaf. It wasn't a book as such. They started reading those ayat. And I said, then the Nabi told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La Mushaf. None of you should travel to the land of the enemy carrying the Mushaf. The Mushaf. Where, where's the Mushaf, Ya Zayd? Where's the Mushaf? He said, wow, you're right. He said, at that point, my heart opened up and I embraced it. He said, in Wallahi, if they had asked me to go and move Mount Uhud from there to there, moving Mount Uhud would have been easier. Like Umar earlier. Abu Musa Ash'ari gave him a hadith that Umar never heard. Umar said, I'm going to hit you with this stick. Those companions did not like people saying weak hadith. Those companions were not People were easy with innovation in the religion. So again, the 17-year-old boy, radiallahu anhu, he wasn't afraid of Abu Bakr, although he knew that the Nabi said, Iqtadu bayladaini min ba'di. Follow the two after me, Abu Bakr and Umar. And here they come, and they're talking to him. And he said, I'm not doing it. He knows he has to listen to the Amir, but not in what is in disobedience to Allah. When he thought bringing the Quran together was an innovation, he said, I'm not doing it. Because the companions didn't know this. Last issue, Ikhwani, because we have to make Salat al Maghrib, is Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. He traveled to some people and they wanted to know what's the best Hajj you can make. Our community is a community if someone came and gave you a ticket and gave you a visa and said, Go ahead, go and make Hajj. You, my man, go make Hajj, go make Umrah. Here's the money, here's the ticket, go. You're going to stay in such and such hotel right in front of the Kaaba and the other one right in front of Medina. Go and make Umrah, go and make Hajj. Most people are not going to know what to do. Most Muslims are not going to know what to do. And it's one of the pillars of Islam. Hey, I'm a new Muslim. Show me how the Nabi prayed. He prayed in front of the people and he told the people, pray the way you just saw me praying. Tell the Muslim, come show me. People don't know how he prayed. Concerning this issue, they said to Ibn Abbas, what's the best type of hajj to make? The best type of hajj, he said, is a tamattur, where you make umrah, and then you come out of your ihram, and you're in Mecca, and then on the day where people make hajj, you put your ihram on again, and then you make hajj. There's another hajj called al-ikram, where you make umrah, but you don't come out of your ihram. You make umrah, and then you make hajj. And the last one is al-ifrad, where you don't make umrah, you just go and you make hajj. That's it. It's the easiest one. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the best hajj is a tamattur. And he didn't make tamattur. He didn't make a tamattur. They said to Ibn Abbas, what's the best type of hajj? Based upon the Sunni, he said a tamattur. The people say, yeah, but Abu Bakr and Umar, they didn't say that. He said, what? I'm getting out of here. I'm leaving the city. You ask me something and I tell you, that the Nabi said something and you tell me Abu Bakr and Umar? He said, I'm afraid that rocks are going to come from the sky and destroy you people. You tell, you ask me, what's the delil? I tell you, Rasulullah said, and you tell me Abu Bakr and Umar? What do you think is the case with someone who's asked a question, he gives the answer of Quran and Sunnah, and then the person says, yeah, but um, Tahir Qadir didn't say that. <laughs> Tahir Qadir didn't say that. Or anybody else for that matter. So in concluding, Ikhwan, in concluding, in concluding, is there any other proof clearer than the proof that those four Imams themselves told the people, don't go and follow us? And Imam Ahmed told his people, La tukalliduni, don't follow me, and don't follow Ozari, don't follow Malik. Take from where they took from. 
And Imam Shafi told the people, it's not permissible for you to blindly follow me. And Imam Abu Hanifa told the people, my madhab is the authentic hadith. If it's authentic, then that's my madhab. If it's authentic, if what I say goes against the sunnah, then take my statements and reject it. Abu Yusuf, Yaqub was writing, and Imam Abu Hanifa was talking, and he was writing diligently. He said, Wayhat, Ya Yaqub, hey, Abu Yusuf, what are you doing? He said, I'm a human being. I say something today and I change my mind tomorrow. Meaning, I have an opinion about something today and then the proof comes and I take the other position. Why are you writing everything that I write? That I have to say. Take it easy. All four of those imams said that. <laughs> so when concluding, if you don't have the ability to figure something out, then follow someone who you respect. No problem. Follow them. But if you have the ability to figure it out, and you can read this, and you can read that, and you can cross-examine to the best of your ability, Allah Azza wa is not going to ask you, Yom Qiyam, about Fulan and Fulan. He's going to ask you in your grave, who's your Lord? Who's your Lord? What's your religion? And what did you have to say about that man who came to you? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As for the one who said, oh, my Imam said, my Imam did, on that day, a seven Umariyam and those Imams are going to free themselves from the people. And then the people follow the Imams in fit issues that are wrong. But when it comes to the Aqidah of the Imam, the Imam Abu Hanifa never said that the Nabi was Hazir and Nazir. Never said that the Nabi never died. Never said that the Nabi was in every place. He said anyone who... And Imam Abu Hanifa in, in his book, Al-Fiqh Al-Akbar, said anyone who says that Allah is everywhere is a kaf. So the people follow them in fiqh, they don't follow them in aqidah, the people follow them in fiqh issues that go along with them, in fiqh issues they don't like, your daughter, your daughter Abu Hanifa says she doesn't need a wali, so if she runs off and goes to London and she gets married without your participation, you're going to say to her what are you doing? If she said to you, the men have said, you're not going to agree to that, it's going to be a problem so let us return, inshallah for those of us who are on that blind following issue, let us return to our senses and follow the kitab and the sunnah and we use the positions and the statements and the books and the madahib as guiding lights to help to navigate ourselves but we don't make them the goal and the objective in worshiping Allah Azza wa but those of you who never were upon that stuff maintain the course learn knowledge about the thing and don't go overboard and don't describe people who are madahibs or people who blind following things that they don't have the ability to understand or comprehend don't describe them as being a straight or innovators. I call the call behind the stuff for Allah and even like when that's Allah and Tara to fit with Sadat. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. After Maghrib, inshallah, we have a few minutes of question and answer, inshallah. Ahi, Jazakallah khair. Asalaamu alaikum. The questions by writing, inshallah, um, there's pen and papers upstairs. Salaam Imam Rahim. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam in Jorno, he used to make the sajda. And he used to ask Allah Ta'ala in his sajda, and he said that the closest of serving is to Allah's when he's in sajda. He used to say, Allahumma ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qalbi ala deenik. And it was a fact that he would never go astray. But he still nonetheless asked Allah Azza wa Jal to establish his heart on the deen, teaching us. The Nabi in his dua of al qunut Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the winter. Part of his dua in the beginning was Rabbana Allahumma ihdini fi man ahdayt Allahumma ihdini fi man hadayt Allah guide me from those who you have guided. He was never going to go astray. He was going to be guided. He was teaching us that. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam shows the importance of everybody making dua. And Allah guides you to the correct way. Surah Al-Fatiha Many people read that ayah and they believe that the Nabi is Hazir Nazir. Many people read that ayah and they curse the companions. 
Many people read that ayah and believe that the Quran is not complete. When the Nabi used to wake up for what? Salat at Tahajjud, Qiyamul Layl, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He used to ask Allah when he woke up in the middle of the night to make Qiyamul Layl. Allahumma Rabbi Jibreel wa Mika'il wa Israfil, Fatir al Samawat wa Ard, Alim al Ghayb wa Shahada. أنت تحكم بين عبادك فيما كانوا فيه يختلفون اهتني بما اختلف فيه من الحق بإذنه إنك تهتي من تشاء ولا سراط المستقيم أو الله the Lord of Jibril Mikael Israfil the creator of the heavens and the earth the knower of what is seen and what is unseen you guide the people in those things that there is اختلاف about so guide me in the issues of اختلاف Guide me to the right way. Verily, you guide whoever you want to guide to the Salat al-Mustaqeem. He said that whenever he woke up for Qiyam al in the dua of al-Istiftah, after saying Allah Akbar, he would say that dua, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the shahid and the point of all of that, ikhwani, is that uh, no human being, if he's living, no human being can exist in this dunya walking around as if he's all that without realizing your ta'if. Antum fuqara'u in Allah. Everybody is weak and miskeen and in need of Allah Ta'ala's guidance. We think that we're guided right, but that doesn't take away from the fact that you have to humble yourselves. We have to humble ourselves and make dua to Allah to always guide us to issues where there's ikhtilaf. And in this issue of a taqlid, just to recap so that people understand what I'm saying. My wife will understand what I'm saying. People I came to this place in the car with will understand what I'm saying. I'm not here to put anybody down who wants to make taqlid and a'ma in everything. It's your issue. You're going to be raised in front of Allah Azza wa It's going to deal with you. I'm not here to change your mind or to fight you or to put you down. I'm just here to present the scholastic way of understanding this issue, inshallah. That is, if a Muslim has the ability to recognize the truth, to appreciate the truth, to distinguish the truth, then he has to follow that truth. He has to follow it when it comes to him. And no matter who is in opposition to that truth, like Al-Imam Al-Uzari said, he's one of the Imams of the Medhabs. And his Medhab was bigger and better than the other four Medhabs. His madhah, and Imam al uzai His madhah was just as big as the other madhahs. He used to advise the Muslims, he used to say, be with the truth. Be with the truth. No matter who's with you on the truth. And don't become faint-hearted and afraid because only a few people were with you. And don't be like freaked out. Don't be amazed at the many numbers of people on something else. Many people on Kufr, many people on Christianity, many people on Brailism or whatever. Don't look at it and say, oh, that's an indication it's the truth. Be on the truth, even if it's by yourself, you're by yourself. The Jama'ah, Abdullah bin Mas'ud, I told you. He said, the Jama'ah is what is consistent with the truth, even if you're by yourself. Abu Bakr was the Jama'ah on that particular day, and he was all by himself, and everybody else was against him. So, at Taqlid, shouldn't be done and what the person has the ability to make his mind up. Take the truth, take the delil, and allow him to be responsible to follow what he revealed in the Quran and what the Prophet brought in the Sunnah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what you don't have the ability to manage academically, scholastically, is too much for you, then you blindly follow someone. Someone comes with this issue about Islamic mortgages. Islamic mortgages is a big issue. And you want to fear Allah. You don't want to fall into uh, a riba and so forth and so on. You sit down and you ask them, what's your opinion concerning that thing? And it's too much for you to grasp. You have to look for some scholar from the Sunnah. Not some everyday Amr Bakr Zaid. Some scholar from the Sunnah. You appreciate, you respect, and you trust his Islam. You know he's not taking advantage of you. No, he's not asking you for money. He's not misguiding you. And you blindly follow him in that thing. He say you can do it. And you don't know. You can blindly follow him in that issue. Now if you're playing around, 
and you're just jumping from scholar to scholar and you find something to say something that you want, then you're going to be held accountable for that. But if the issue, whatever the issue is, comes to you, that's just one of the issues. And I have to say this because that's what I believe. I don't care who like it or don't like it. Rima, the scholar told you that you trust, you tried to find out, it's too big for you, you don't understand. It's better for you to leave it. It's better for you to leave it. Leave what you doubt for what you don't doubt. But you got a serious situation. You got kids and stuff like that. You try to make the right decision, intelligent decision. This scholar is on the student. You asked him, and he gave you his opinion. And you can't judge it. You can blindly follow that man. And the Nabi says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he'll be responsible for carrying the weight of that decision. He'll be responsible. As for the one who has the ability, to judge something that he can't, and he chooses to follow the Imam, and the Imam is clearly wrong, then that's a problem. And lastly, don't be of the mutqallibin. I told you, the munafiq, the munafiqeen. Allah Ta'ala described them as mudhabdhabin. Mudhabdhabin abayn adhalik, la ilaha ula'i wa la ilaha ula'i. The dhubab is the fly, the fly. It's called dhubab because it's all over the place. The verb tadhabdhaba. It means a person who's bouncing all over the place. The munafiq, sometimes he's with the Muslims because it's benefit. Sometimes with the kuffar, it's benefit. He doesn't care about them, he doesn't care about them. He just wants to go where there is benefit. Don't make that your religion. Don't be mutadabdib. You just go everywhere the thing is just turning you and this like that. Don't be like the munafiqeen. Be like the people who have a minhaj and how you make decisions and how you arrive at conclusions. So with that, inshallah ta'ala will open up the door about the tadabda. The point that I wanted to make is in every method, in every method, there is what is correct and there is what is incorrect. And if you tell the person you must follow the method, you must, you're telling the person you gotta follow what's wrong. Because in every method, is right and wrong because every human being makes mistakes so you can't say that to someone and then you have the people as I mentioned earlier in the Hanafi Madhab in the Hanafi Madhab your wife, your mother, your sister the gold that she wears the gold that she wears and Imam Abu Hanifa Rahimullah was of the opinion every Ramadan she has to pay zakat on that gold every Ramadan as long as she has that gold she has to keep paying zakat and Imam Ahmed wasn't on that opinion. And Imam Shafi wasn't on her opinion. They said if it's her goal of wearing and beautification, she doesn't have to pay. But if she has gold saved up and his money and stuff, she has to pay. But the gold that she wears, she doesn't have to pay. So the person says, I know I'm Hanafi, but I'm going to take the other method in this. Because I don't want to pay every Ramadan. I don't want to... Don't be like that. If your daughter runs off and she gets married without you being the wali, what are you going crazy for? That was Ali Imam Abu Hanifa's position. Although his two students, Hamid ibn Hassan al-Shaybani and Abu Yusuf, radiallahu anhum ajma'in, all of them, the two of them, went against Al Imam Abu Hanifa in a third of the madhab. A third. They rejected a third of what he said. They didn't follow him in all of those other issues because they learned from Al Imam al Shafi. Because they learned from Al Imam Ahmed. <coughs> Because they learn from other ulama, from al hadith and the fuqaha of their time. So if you brothers have any questions, inshallah ta'ala, we'll answer your questions. Tell the guy. Sir, can you please explain at what point and how it became imposed on the people not to ascribe to a particular mother? Because they say that if you don't follow one of these mothers, then your imam is shaitan. Yeah, that's a good question. It's a very technical question, a scholastic question that requires a scholastic answer. When did this issue of imposing and enforcing people to take a method, when did that come into existence? It wasn't there during the time of the companions. It wasn't there during the time of the tabi'een. And it wasn't there until the latter part of the followers of the tabi'een. Then the people after them when they found that they were ulama, great scholars, the students started to write down their positions and their statements. And four of the madhabs remain, and many of the other ones left. But as I told you, Ikhwan, there were scholars who had madhabs who were better or just as good as the four madhabs. 
الإمام إسحاق بن إبراهيم راهويا his madhab is better than those four madhabs is better than those four madhabs as they said themselves Al-Imam Sa'd ibn Layf had a madhab Al-Layf ibn Sa'd Al-Uzai had a madhab Ibn Hazm the Zahiri madhab they have a madhab that is just as good as the other one although we make some statements that are blameworthy but there's a history as to why the four became the four some of the other imams didn't allow people to write down, tell them, erase everything. I don't want you writing down what I say. So, to answer that question with precision, I would advise you, and I don't even know if this book is still in print, but it's one of the books that our Sheikh Bilal Phillips wrote, that I have hasid against him. I have the positive Islamic jealousy. I wish I would have wrote that book before him. The Evolution of Fiqh, of the Midahid. That book is in English. I think it went out of print. I don't know. But that book, when we were growing up, on the Sunnah, that was a very useful book. Academic, scholastic, and informative. And in that book, he'll give you in English the uh, historical reasons, the political reasons that transpired, that killed off all of the other Madahid and saved the ones that are there today. So you guys should uh, try to find that book if you can uh, find that book. But the answer is very precise. Generally speaking, there were some positive reasons and negative reasons why these four madhabs remained and other ones didn't remain. Sometimes the leader used to give money if you memorize the particular madhab. They would give money so people would memorize. Other scholars said, no, I don't want you to memorize my madhab. But it started happening in the end of the third century and the fourth century that these madhabs became... Um, where the people wrote them down what to do. Other thing, before we take the brother Muhammad Rahman's question, inshallah, if there was a scholar of a madhab, Hanafi madhab, in Hayat, and he was a serious scholar, like Ali Imam Abu Ja'far al Tahawi, Aqidat al Tahawiyah, he was Hanafi. Ali Imam Ali al Qari, a scholar like that of the Hanafi madhab, Wallahi, I will come from Birmingham and come here whenever I can to learn from him. Because the madhab is nothing but a systematic way of getting to the truth. The madhab, all of the madhab, is a systematic way, a way of taking steps to arrive at the truth. I'm going to take the Quran, I'm going to take the Sunnah, and I'm going to take the Ijma, and I'm going to take the Qiyas, and I'm going to take the Qawm Sahabi, then I'm going to take the action of the people of Medina, then I'm going to take the Stihsad, then I'm going to take the Al Mursal Al Mursal Al and the scholars of those men that had differences of what to put first and so forth and so on. It's just a systematic way. Now, if you take a men take the men as a systematic way. But whenever the men is wrong, just put it to the side in that issue. That's all. That's all. So don't go over the board. Brothers who are trying to be on the Sunday, you try to be Salafi, of Adam Hadith, and you should be. You should do. But don't go over, overboard. If you have a Medhab, that's an innovation. Okay. Ibn Utaymi is a Muqtadi. Ibn Rajab was a Muqtadi. Ibn Kathir was a Muqtadi. Those great scholars. And Imam Ibn Kathir was a student of Ibn Utaymi. Ibn Utaymi is Had Hanbali, and Ibn Kathir is Shafi'i. He didn't force that on him, and he didn't force nothing on him. They just did it in a systematic way. And Allah is a'la and a'la. Ahi, muhabbu rahman We had a lecture recently um, in one of our questions locally. And one of the uh, scholars that came, he, he was telling the people openly that you should, and it's from Islam, and Allah commands you to call upon the you know, dead awliya for help when you're in trouble. And he was, in, uh, he was endorsed by the local Imam as well. And the, when we approach the people and say, look, this is against the Quran and Sunnah, they say what you said before, do you have the ability to know? Because you don't, you don't know Arabic, you don't, know, you don't have uh, knowledge of the usul of the deen, so you know, they are bigger scholars than you, so you should do this. So where do we go? As I told you, brothers, already, there are just too many examples from the life of the companions 
and I'll be pleased with all of them that go to show that no one has all of the answers. There are things that people are not aware of, again, because all of the Sunnah has not passed. All of the Sunnah has not found itself inculcated and grasped by one individual. Abu Bakr after the death of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was approached by the grandmother of a deceased person. The grandmother of the deceased approached him and said, I want my miraf, I want my money. Allah Ta'ala mentioned Surah al Misa, everyone who gets money, Abu Bakr memorized the Quran and the grandmother is not in there. Abu Bakr said, I don't know anywhere in the Quran or the Sunnah where the grandmother gets anything. I'm not giving you anything. Someone came and said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. The Prophet وسلم, gave the grandmother a sudus, gave her a sixth of the inheritance. Other people were around living and they shared. So the grandmother got a sixth. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he submitted. Because someone brought him the Daniel. Someone brought him the Daniel. That's how the companions were. You all heard about that incident of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu telling the people, anyone who gives a woman more than the dowry that the Prophet gave his wife, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa radiallahu anhunna, anyone who gives more than that, I'm going to take what the Prophet gave his wives and give it to your wife, and the rest I'm going to give it in the Baytul Ma'ab. The Baytul Ma'ab. Because the Muslims were traveling, they were conquering people, they were getting a lot of money, so they would give the girl 100,000 dinar, 200,000 dinar. And he felt that was a waste of money. You, this thing is not like the wives of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, if anybody gives more, gives more than what the Nabi gave, I'm going to take from it and give him what the Nabi gave his wife and take the rest and put a big to the mouth. The Nabi came and said, Ya Amiru Mumini, Umar, who deserves to be listened to more? You or Allah? You or Allah? Should we listen to you, Shaykh? Or should we listen to Allah? He said, Allah, of course. The lady read the ayah of the Quran again, Surah Al Nisa. What's the beginning of the ayah? If you. When I read to Mr. Dalla Zojem, Makana Zojem, I take to me the only Kintara of Falata who men who she are. If you want to marry a lady and you give her a whole treasure for the dowry, a lot of money, if you give it to her, and you want to divorce her, don't take any of that treasure back. That's her money. So the lady said, in this eye that goes to show the man to give the lady a treasure. Umar in this narration said, the lady spoke the truth and Umar was wrong. Some of the ulama of al-hadith said this hadith has some problems in it, this ethic, some of them accept it. So the point here is, the lady, the lady, she doesn't know what Umar knows. She doesn't know the knowledge of Umar. If there was a nabi after me, it would have been Umar. It would have been Umar. But the lady had the delil, and the delil wasn't with Umar radiallahu anhu, and he relaxed. So our religion, ikhwani, is not, you don't know, you don't know. And I believe that people say this because they don't have anywhere to go, so they just say it. But there's a flip side to that that we have to mention, we have to be careful about. And again, this is the Surat al-Mustaqeem. The flip side of that is, one of us thinking too much of yourself. Everybody here is minuscule in knowledge. Everybody here. We're minuscule in knowledge. We don't have a lot of knowledge. So you can't get up and start giving fatwas. So-and-so's muqtadi. So-and-so jahwa ta'adil. So-and-so's this, that. No. It's two extremes. And Nabi said to the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, verily, in the desert there is a tree that resembles the Muslim, the Mu'min. Do you know what tree it is? The elder Sahabas, the ulama started saying, it's that tree, it's that tree, it's this tree, it's that. And they were getting it wrong. 
And then Umar was young and he was looking, he was young. He said, when I saw everybody was getting it wrong, I was shy, I didn't say anything. I thought it was the date palm tree. But when I saw the ulama of the companions not saying anything, I didn't say anything. So the Nabi, when no one got it, he said, it's the date palm tree. He left. Ibn Umar said to his father, Umar, Ya Abi, I had said it was the date palm tree, but when I looked around and I saw you quiet, and Abu Bakr were quiet, and other people were getting it wrong, I, I was shy, so I didn't even say anything. Oh, I'm not saying if you would have said it, it would have made me more happier than the red camel. That my son knows the answer. So why did Abdullah bin Umar, why did he hold back? Why did he hold back? Because he looked at the ulama. He didn't do what the people do today. Some of these crazy people, some of these people who go beyond their level. Anwar al-Awlaki. Anwar al-Awlaki. If we have knowledge, ikhwani, then we talk with knowledge. You don't have knowledge, you don't talk. Some people will say, Anwar al-Awlaki is from the Khawarij. Yeah, he may be from the Khawarij, may not be from the Khawarij, but that's not for you to give that ruling. It's not for you to give that ruling. It's not for you, it's not for you, it's not for me. It's for the scholar to give that ruling. He did make some statements that the Khawarij make, but that doesn't mean he's from the Khawarij. A person makes a statement of shirk, doesn't mean he's a mushrik. Person makes a statement and action of innovation. Doesn't mean he's an innovator. So if he's from the Khawarij, it has rules and regulations that's going to come as a result of that. And that's for the ulama to talk, not for the regular people. So we have these two extremes. The one extreme of the people who the sheikh said, the sheikh said, the sheikh said, are you better than the sheikh? And everybody suffer from that. Even 70 people suffer from that. Then the other extreme is the person who puts his foot in the arena that Umar if this issue was presented to Umar, he would have said, hold on, let me gather up the people who participated in better. And once he gathered them together, he would say, what's your position? He would say, next, 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 until it went all the way around the circle again. But the people today, the way we are, we have to feel validated. Here I am, listen to me. So what the people are saying is incorrect. Because the Quran and the Sunnah pushes it away, and this is the type of taqlid that is haram. This is the type of taqlid that is haram. You have the ability to see the Quran and to see the Sunnah. What was the issue they said? Calling upon the dead awliya for help if you're in trouble. Anyway, so Allah Ta'ala has clearly established in ayat upon ayat upon ayat that you can't call on and on anyone other than Allah. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has established hadith upon hadith upon hadith and you can't call on anyone other than Allah. Then the person comes and says, the Imam must know, the Sheikh must know. This is from the Taqlid, that's not permissible. Especially for people like you guys. Our parents and our grandparents coming from near poor, they couldn't read and they couldn't write. They couldn't read and write. They were ummi yum. They were illiterate. You people can read, you can people can write, the internet. Allah Ta'ala mentioned to those people about who the Nabi was. Whether Qila Law mit Tabi Uma and Zalallah Kalu Balna Tabi Uma al Fayna Alehi Aba Anna. Awalu Kana Aba Umaya Kiluna Shayam Walaya Tadu. If it is said to them, follow what Allah revealed, they say, No, we're gonna follow what we found our fathers doing. Although their fathers didn't have any haqqan, and they weren't guided in the right, they couldn't even read and write. So sometimes when you're ignorant, people can take advantage of you easily. Got magic on you? It comes to the sheikh. The sheikh says, so not magic? Okay. You have to get five kangaroo heads. You got to get six tails of six pregnant female rats. And you have to dig a hole seven and a half inches. Mix each head and tail together and then bury it and about four inches you have to put seven dead spiders of this species four feet high and it, the guy says but but among the side I don't know where I'm gonna get kangaroo heads from I'm gonna get the pregnant rat from he said look don't worry just give me 500 pounds I'll get it for you <laughs> and the person said okay okay among this okay okay because it's mine he's he wants to get out of his problem he's ignorant but the person the person like us who's growing up the Malvi Sahib, our parents, our parents, the Malvi Sahib's son becomes the Malvi, and his son becomes the... We're going to say, 
Why, why he gotta be the next monkey? Why I can't be the monkey? Who, naturally, because of the society, we're gonna say, why is he the monkey, the son of the monkey? Why I can't be the monkey? Our parents didn't ask those questions. Just when we do the khatam, they do the khatam, they do the yarmi, they do the mawli, and then they just say, mother, son, come, 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 bless the food. Do the, do the, do the. No, we, we have some education. So just be in the middle, buddy, be in the middle. Now, anyone, and I'm not against the Malvi Saab. There are some Malvi Saabs who are, mashallah, only of Allah, ulama, alul hadith, people of the Sunnah. I'm talking about the, mal, the local Malvi Saabs. These people who they, 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 our kids can't relate to them. They don't know. These people don't know this religion. Nor do they know what our kids are being confronted with today. The young boy came to the Nabi in front of all the people say, Ya Rasulullah, give me permission to make zina. Because he was young, he was filling his Cheerios. He wanted to make zina. The Nabi, the people looked at him and said, What are you doing? What's wrong with you? You're crazy saying that in public? The boy wasn't trying to hear that. He's a youngster. He said, Ya Rasul, give me. He said, Come here. You want the people to do that to your mother? To your mother? No. People to your mother. You want to do that to your sister? No, I would be that. You want the people to do that to your auntie? No, I would be that. The people don't want that to their sister. He took him and he made dua, and the thing went away. Then if he helped the young man like that, he knew what he was going through. He knows the nature of the young man. Now the young boy today, 16, 17, he's smoking crap. He's smoking weed. He wants to make toba. He has a girlfriend. You can't go to the Mulvi Saab and say, Mulvi Saab, I'm smoking weed. What can I do? Because the Mulvi Saab's going to rat him out. Going to rat him out? Tell us what. You what? You smoking weed? Call his mother's father. You know your kid is smoking weed, right? You know he has a boyfriend, girlfriend. Right? So, I'm not against the Mulvi Saab. I'm against the Mulvi Saab who's against us. Teaching us shit, getting kufr and take advantage of us. That's the one I'm against. Anyway, any more questions, Ikhwani? That's it. I just want you guys to meet my son-in-law right here. My son-in-law. Yes, my son right here. Real man. Face him. And my daughter and my wife is on the other side. Over there. So I hope the sisters take care of both of them. Inshallah. And please forgive me for being late because it was my wife's fault. Being late. I'm so sorry about that. Right? Subhanakallahu wa bihamdika. Wa ashadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.